Uh, my name is Antonio. My podcast is Unapologetically Black. Ask that you like and subscribe to the page and share the videos as much as possible so we can begin to communicate to one another what is exactly going on with our people and dealing with these Europeans. Now, in the next video, I'm going to discuss the subject of white trash and how whites was propelled to their level in just to oppress blacks. But this video, what I want to talk about is the fact that whites expect blacks to suffer in silence and deal with our oppression without doing anything about it or without speaking up for ourselves. Whites expect blacks to suffer in silence, to deal with the oppression without voicing an opinion. This is what is expected for whites, and we are expected to do that because any black man standing upright or black woman standing upright claiming a rightful position makes white people feel insecure. I do not abide by this philosophy. I will not be ashamed of who I am as a black man. I will not be less than who I am in order to allow white people to feel confident in who they are. And I will not hide or lower my speaking when I speak on the violent nature of white people and their lack of humanity. I base that solely off of their actions. Showing you here why people expect us to suffer in silence and accept oppression. From the present. Uh, at the same time, a piece of white fragility is that white people are not taught their history. We don't know our history. So I want to acknowledge that. I want to position myself, of course, as a white person. Uh, and I'm talking to a very, uh, talking and addressing a very, very specific dynamic. This is arguably the most complex, uh, nuanced social dilemma since the beginning of this country. Uh, and there are myriad roads in, and all of them are essential. But so consistently left off the table is uh, whiteness, right? So we often learn about this group and that group and their struggles and their triumphs and their heroes and heroines. And yet, we don't ask ourselves struggles and triumphs in relation to whom, right? Uh, and so charge uh, and so much defensiveness and on and on uh, for white people around race that we can, when we begin to get challenged, we can shut down really quickly or glaze over or tune out. Uh, and all of those, of course, function to protect our positions and hold our worldviews in place. And so to air this out and open it up. So I want to start uh, by reading a bit from the beginning. White people in North America live in a society that is deeply separate and unequal by race, and white people are the beneficiaries of that separation and inequality. As a result, we are insulated from racial stress at the same time that we come to feel entitled to and deserving of our advantage. Given how seldom we experience racial discomfort in a society we dominate, we haven't had to build our racial stamina. Socialized into a deeply internalized sense of superiority that we either are unaware of or can never admit to ourselves, we become highly fragile in conversations about race. We consider a challenge to our racial worldviews as a challenge to our very identities as good moral people. Thus, we perceive any attempt to connect us to the system of racism as an unsettling and unfair moral offense. The smallest amount of racial stress is intolerable. The mere suggestion that being white has meaning often triggers a range of defensive responses. And these include emotions such as anger, fear, and guilt, and behaviors such as argumentation, silence, and withdrawal from the stress-inducing situation. These responses work to reinstate white equilibrium as they repel the challenge, return our racial comfort, and maintain our dominance within the racial hierarchy. I conceptualize this process as white fragility. Though white fragility is triggered by discomfort and anxiety, it is born of superiority and entitlement. White fragility is not weakness per se. 
In fact, it is a powerful means of white racial control and the protection of white advantage. In my early days uh, of work of what was then termed a diversity trainer, I was taken aback by how angry and defensive so many white people became at the suggestion that they were connected to racism in any way. The very idea that they would be required to attend a workshop on racism outraged them. They entered the room angry and made that feeling clear to us throughout the day as they slammed their notebooks down on the table, refused to participate in exercises, and argued against any and all points. I couldn't understand their resentment or disinterest in learning more about such a complex social dynamic as racism. These reactions were especially perplexing when there were few or no people of color in their workplace and they had the opportunity to learn from my co-facilitators of color. I assumed that in these circumstances, an educational workshop on racism would be appreciated. After all, didn't the lack of diversity indicate a problem or at least suggest that some perspectives were missing? Or that the participants might be undereducated about race because of scant cross-racial interactions? It took me several years to see beneath these reactions. Um, at first, I was intimidated by them, and they held me back and kept me careful and quiet. But over time, I began to see what lay beneath this anger and resistance to discuss race or listen to people of color. I observed consistent responses from a variety of participants. <clears throat> she called it white fragility. Let's be clear, it's white insecurity. But whites would not face their insecurities rather than face their insecurities about competing with blacks and the fact that they are in their current condition due to white privilege. They would rather turn anger and attack the black people for voicing their opinion about their condition. This is why there's no hope of any racial consolidation in America. When one side refused to acknowledge their wrongs to you and how they participated in your racial discrimination and refused to acknowledge the effects of those conditions that they help create upon you, how can you reach a middle ground with such people? Do we, you want us to cater to their fragile egos and continue to be humble or continue to be submissive or less than someone else? This is why King said freedom will not be given, it will be taken. The oppressor will never feel as if it was the appropriate time for you as a people to protest or to fight against your oppression. On this day, this very day, 60 years ago, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was arrested along with 55 others, and was jailed in Birmingham, Alabama. The notorious segregationist Bull Connor ordered the arrest of Dr. Martin Luther King on April 12, 1963, for, quote, parading without a permit. That was during a protest against segregation in Birmingham. And Dr. Martin Luther King was sentenced to a Birmingham jail after the United Auto Workers paid his $160,000 bail Dr. King was released from that jail eight days later on April 20th while in that jail Martin Luther King nine piece nonviolent peaceful protest was arrested multiple times fighting for his freedoms, fighting for the rights that supposed to have been afforded to him born an American citizen. The judicial system has always been used as a weapon 
or as a means to prevent blacks from seeking their just rights. Let's be clear about this. Dr. King was in a dark cell alone with no mattress and was denied any phone calls. He was smuggled a Birmingham newspaper that had published a letter by eight white local clergymen in response to civil rights protests in Alabama. In that letter, the white clergymen wrote that they, quote, strongly urge our own Negro community to withdraw support from these demonstrations and to unite locally in working peacefully for a better Birmingham. When rights are consistently denied, a cause should be pressed in the courts and in negotiations among local leaders and not in the streets. Dr. King responded with a 21-page handwritten letter written in the darkness of that cell, which was soon read around the world and has been read ever since, having become known simply as the letter from Birmingham City Jail. It is the single most widely read letter in the history of letter writing. Dr. Martin Luther King wrote, we know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Frankly, I have yet to engage in a direct action movement that was well-timed, according to the timetable of those who have not suffered unduly from the disease of segregation. For years now, I have heard the word wait. It rings in the ear of every Negro, Negro with a piercing familiarity. This wait has almost always meant never. We must come to see with the distinguished jurist of yesterday that justice too long delayed is justice denied. There comes a time when the cup of endurance runs over and men are no longer willing to be plunged into an abyss of injustice where they experience the bleakness of corroding despair. I submit that an individual who breaks a law that conscience tells him is unjust and willingly accepts the penalty by staying in jail to arouse the conscience of the community over its injustice is, in reality, expressing the very highest respect for law. Today in Tennessee, the Tennessee Three invoked the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. when they spoke in Memphis outside the Lorraine Motel where Dr. King was assassinated in 1968. It is now a museum. They began last week as three members of the Tennessee House of Representatives subjected to of the Hugh Hewitt Show on Salem Radio Network and the host of Hugh Hewitt right here on MSNBC. Thanks to both of you for being with us. Uh, Brian, let me start with you. We had seen, I think, a bit of a lull, actually, at the start of this season in terms of uh, NFL players on the sidelines during the anthem participating in, in a form of protest. On Sunday, obviously, everything changed. Uh, I'd never seen that many players participating in it. What was the message? What was the message w w that you say uh, would say they were delivering uh, with so many NFL players doing that? Was this about the original issue of police uh, uh, brutality, of policing? Was this about the president? What was the message that, that, that came out of that? I think it's a combination of things. I think when you look at the fact that there was, some guys stood up last year, some guys were well, kneeled down, some guys sat down, but a lot of guys were on that fence and not understanding whether or not they wanted to put themselves out there. You know, they watched what happened to Kyle Ka Ka Kaepernick and how he was ostracized and things like that, so some guys backed off of it. But once the president came out and he began to challenge guys and attack them in that manner, you're talking about a bunch of competitors out there. They're going to they're gonna galvanize and come together, and they're going to support their uh, guys that are doing things. Uh, most of these guys do great things in the community. Most of these these guys try to go out there and combat different things that a lot of guys are kneeling to talk about. And then all of a sudden, you get someone calls them sons. Wouldn't you love to see one of these NFL owners when somebody disrespects our flag?
to say, get that son of a bitch off the field right now. Out. He's fired. He's fired. Now, NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell released this statement just a few minutes ago. The NFL and our players are at our best when we help create a sense of unity in our country and our culture. There is no better example than the amazing response from our clubs and players to the terrible natural disasters we've experienced over the last month. Divisive comments like these demonstrate an unfortunate lack of respect for the NFL, our great game, and all of our players, and a failure to understand the overwhelming force for good our clubs and players... That was Donald Trump attacking Colin Kaepernick about him kneeling for the national anthem in protest of police brutality in uh, in America, right? Years before the uh, 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 years before George Floyd ever happened. So be clear. Like King says, the oppressor is never going to feel it's an appropriate time or an appropriate way to protest against their oppression. You can cater to this white fertility all you want. The fact that they refuse to accept their racial behavior and how they help implement them racial policies for the top elite that help impoverish them you can overlook that all you want, but me, I want separation from these Europeans.